Errol Morris, everybody. Thank you all for being here. Should we sit or stand? Uh, either is fine with me. <coughs> so what do you think? Pretty good movie, right? <laughs> I'll sort of get the ball rolling with a few questions or comments, and then I'm sure everybody out there have a lot of things they want to ask you. Um, as I watched the movie tonight, um, it became very clear to me after just a few minutes that this is not just a movie about pet cemeteries. It's about a lot of other things. And I found myself searching as the film unfolded for what I thought the film was really about. At a certain point, I thought this is a film about attachment and about human sensitivity, particularly when we see the, um, the, the, the first person who really you, 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 you introduce us to. And then at a certain point, I thought, you know, actually this is a film about business. It's about entrepreneurs. And then it continues. And finally, I kind of conclude that what I think this film is about is belief and how people invest in a belief. Uh, they, they, they invest their lives in, in, in a belief or an ideal. Um, so I think it's about all of those things. It covers a lot of ground. Um, and I don't know, you've got a certain look on your face like you, you think I'm an idiot, but... No, 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 <laughs> not these at are, all. These are some of the things that, kind of, uh, that I kind of found myself kind of you know, hitting upon as, as the film unfolded. Um, and I, I, I wondered, when you make a film like this, you perhaps start out with an idea of what the film is going to be. What and makes then, you say that? Well, because you, you do, you're doing something. You're, you're, you're investing in something by making a film. And I'm curious as to whether as the film unfolded and then as you were editing the film and, and completing the film, if what it meant to you changed and evolved during that process. Well, several thoughts. The, the what's it about question is always a somewhat difficult qu question for me to answer, not just simply with regard to this movie, but I might also add with regard to my entire life <laughs> and the other movies. Um, I don't know what it's about. Am I supposed to? Is that part of my job description? Um, it's very odd being back at Lincoln Center with this movie. Uh, I had no idea whether this movie would be shown anywhere. And it was accepted at the New York Film Festival. And this was a year where there was a newspaper strike. So there were no reviews forthcoming. Uh, uh, we were so late uh, getting the film out of the lab. Uh, Duart no longer exists, but in those days it was Duart. We had to schlep the film reel by reel into the projection room, and the movie was already running. Uh, and we were trying to stay up with the movie itself so we would get the reels on time. Um, uh, it may be my single favorite question that anyone has asked me, uh, I challenge you to do better. Uh, in a Q&A, and this was immediately um, following the first screening of Gates of Heaven, and a woman in the audience stood up and said, you know, this movie w would be better cut in half. Uh, uh, and I said, well, you know, the same could be said for you. <laughs> That's many years ago now. <laughs> and this movie was destined for obscurity. I mean, yes, I can thank 
the New York Film Festival, but in particular, I can thank two critics who championed this movie and started reviewing it compulsively. Um, one review, two reviews, three reviews, I think four reviews in one year. And that was Roger Ebert and Gene Siskel. And I am still deeply indebted to both of them. Um, uh, one is no longer with us. The other one, I hope, will be with us forever. So what is it about? I think this is to show you that I can be responsive, <laughs> sort of. Um, the principle of, I mean, I'm not sure I have any idea what documentary filmmaking is about or nonfiction filmmaking is about. But I do know that at heart, I'm an investigator. and. By that I mean, I really don't know what I'm going to hear in an interview. Uh, my view is if you know what you're going to hear in an interview, why bother? What's the point? You should be surprised. Um, you should hear the unexpected and better yet, the unimaginable. Um, and that happened f for whatever reason again and again and again and again in the making of this movie. Um, <laughs> what, I had a plan to get someone to talk about the R2A2 formula? <laughs> Recognize, relate, assimilate, and the call to action? Not really. Um, the pet explosion? <laughs> Not so much. Um, I, I knew there was a movie here fairly early on. I had no idea what kind of movie, but I knew that there was something something that could be made out of all of this material. When I met Floyd McClure, the guy in the wheelchair, and I referred to Floyd during the editing of the movie as my Hegelian. Why? Because Floyd would never say, it's in the movie, I believe, although I didn't see the very beginning of it this time around. Um, Floyd would never say what this country needs is a pet cemetery. Floyd would always say what this country needs is the concept of a pet cemetery. <laughs> a Hegelian. <laughs> and once he kind of got really excited and he said what this country needs is the concept of a concept of a pet cemetery. <laughs> now, does that answer the question just a little bit? Just a little bit, yeah. Um, maybe we can kind of roll back to before you began shooting. Um, what, um, it, what drew you to make this film after making Vernon, Florida? I mean, I know that- I made it before. I made Vernon, Florida. Oh, you did? Yes, it's my first movie. And it's pretty easy to describe the underlying motivation. Um, one word, desperation. Um, I used to think that when I became as desperate as the people I was filming, that the movie would get made. No, I made this movie, and then I made, years after that, Vernon, Florida, and then no one wanted to give me money to make movies. That was it. Kaputskis. Um, and years went by. I worked as a private detective 
in New York to earn a living. And I finally got money to interview this Dallas psychiatrist. Um, and the joke was, I said, well, thank God I don't have to be a private detective anymore. And that was the beginning of the Thin Blue Line. It was two and a half years of detective work in Texas. But I've had this, I think it's fair to say, somewhat spotty career because there have been long stretches where I just was unable to work. My wife tells me that many of the ideas that I had, I would submit proposal after proposal after proposal to public broadcasting. That was the only act in town. There was no independent film deal. There was nothing. Um, uh, and these proposals would be rejected one after the other. I wanted to do a movie on spontaneous human combustion, <laughs> which was going to be titled a blaze exclamation mark. <laughs> you know, I thought this is. An you could idea. still do that now. I mean, you could. You could. That could be your next film if you wanted to. No, I'm sort of still thinking about spontaneous human combustion. Is maybe as something that still could happen to me if I'm not careful. But um, well, you you said that that you. Made, you began making this film out of desperation, but I didn't mean so much your existential state as... I know what, you did, what, what drew but I you? was just simply describing it, notwithstanding. What drew you to this, uh, I mean, what was, the, what, was the, what was the catalyst? What was the thing that, that, that got your attention that made you pick up a camera, go out and, and start shooting? Death. <laughs> and... False hope. <laughs> Two of my favorite themes. Um, uh, m m my good friend Ron Rosenbaum had uh, written an essay on the Cancer Cure Underground. And at the end of the essay, he worries. He says, by debunking all of these quack cancer cures, uh, and hence depriving those people who believe in them of the hope that they might work. Maybe it is because of that hope that they do work and therefore depriving them of the possibility of a cure. And at the very end of the essay, he reassures himself not to worry. And after all, false hope springs eternal. That's it. <laughs> Kinda. I guess we're going to see if anyone out there can do a better job than me. <laughs> Questions? Uh, yes. Uh, the question was about the elderly woman um, interviewed about midway through the film who's sitting, I think, on her doorstep, the one that hears the, the, the car horn. Why did, why was she interviewed? She was wonderful. Um, I went through three cameramen, cameramen and camera women, before I finally found Ned Burgess, who shot the film uh, with me. Um, disaster after disaster after disaster. Uh, one cameraman told me that I didn't know how to make documentaries after all. Um, documentaries were made with handheld camera, um, available light, blah, 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 blah. Uh, we got into a fight at Floyd McClure's 
uh, failed pet cemetery. Um, and I believe I pushed him into an open <laughs> pet grave. <laughs> well, arguing about the nature of the montage. <laughs> then, this is day two with another set of crew people. Florence shows up with a caretaker of some kind, a nurse's aide. I'm not sure. She's in this car. Uh, the nurse's aide is driving. She's in the passenger seat. I start talking to her. And at one point, she says, here today, gone tomorrow. She's very, very, very upset. Her pet was buried at this pet cemetery. She doesn't know what's going to happen to it. Here today, gone tomorrow, right? And the sound person interrupts her and says, no, wrong. <laughs> I swear to God. <laughs> no, wrong? <laughs> I've always wondered what upset me more. A, the fact that she interrupted Florence because, after all, that's not her job. Her job is to shut up and record sound. Or B, here today, gone tomorrow, wrong? <laughs> no, Florence is correct here today. <laughs> Gone tomorrow, right. <laughs> and the third cameraman ended up in prison, but that's yet another story. And then I found Ned Burgess, and I made this film. What about the question? <laughs> she was great. Wouldn't you have interviewed her? Yeah, someone said during the editing, well, she doesn't really fit into the movie, does she? I think she does. I think she's absolutely perfect. And she provides that perfect transition between the uh, failed pet cemetery in Los Altos and the successful pet cemetery in Napa. Yes, you. It's very retro. A <laughs> uh, question on uh, what happened to these, any of these people after the movie in the years since follow up. I've lost touch with most of them. I hear occasionally something about the kids at Bubbling Well Pet Memorial Park. Um, I believe this probably will come as no great surprise. Phil left the business. <laughs> and, um, but it's still up there. That's the amazing still extant after all of these years. Um, pets come and go, but Bubbling Well Pet Memorial Park is here to stay. <laughs> yeah. How did people uh, who were in the film respond to it after, if they had a chance to see it? They all saw it. I believe they all saw it. Florence may not have seen it. But we would have been happy to show it to her. Um, uh, everybody at uh, Bubbling Well Pet Memorial Park saw it and kind of liked it. 
I had so many wonderful experiences with the Harberts family. Um, one of my very, very favorites, I was invited for dinner and at some point, Scotty, that's the mom, Scotty's brother looked at me and said, are you a Jew? <laughs> And before I could answer, Scotty said, don't insult him. <laughs> they kind of almost like deserve a film of their own. Indeed. Uh, yeah. Yeah. You. Um, yeah, is, could you, could could Errol tell the story of of Herzog and and I guess they had some wager about um, whether he would finish this film or not. There was no wager; he made it up. <laughs> the answer is Herzog really, really wanted to eat his shoe. And I've to told him subsequently yourself. that I remember the story. Of course, I don't remember the story at all, but I say this anyway. I remember the story slightly differently, that the wager was that if I made the film, he would eat his foot. <laughs> and of course, I'm waiting to collect. Yeah. What intrigues you about the concept of pet cemeteries? I hate rhapsodizing about my own film, but why not? Um, uh, it is a film about love, and somehow um, it's the fact of not love, not who or what you love, which is of great interest. Um, I often would joke after, uh, you know, I make these various appearances uh, following the screening of the movie when it first came out, and I you know, would say, you know, I've heard that people um, have relationships with their pets because they can't have effective relationships with other people. Um, and I would always insist that it properly considered should be seen the other way around. People have relationships with other people because they can't have effective relationships with their pets. Okay. Um, yeah. Um, how many hours of footage do you have, and when did you know that you were done shooting? Done. There's something interesting about filmmaking, about finishing things when you're a filmmaker. Um, you know that you've finished when you've run out of money, and the producers really start screaming at you and they don't stop. <laughs> yeah. My condolences. Thing that you don't like about this film. 
didn't like the print very much. <laughs> it looked like somebody had been walking on it with track shoes. Um, it's such a s strange and primitive film in so many ways. It's almost an anti-film film. film. Um, For years, I programmed movies at the Pacific Film Archive in Berkeley, California. Um, and I was enamored by all kinds of uh, film. Um, uh, wrote program notes for retrospectives of film noir, Douglas Sirk, et cetera, et cetera. S so I took this film, it was shown at the Berlin Film Festival, I forget exactly which year. And Douglas Sirk was there, so I had the opportunity to get him to watch Gates of Heaven. Um, and I really, really admired Sirk, and I still do. I told him that he had made the greatest tragedy since Sophocles. Um, he got up in the middle and walked out, and he said, you know, that's not a movie, that's a slideshow. <laughs> And he also cautioned me. He said, you know, it's possible that some people may look at this ironically. <laughs> I don't know. I often think I became a documentary filmmaker because I had writer's block. I couldn't write for years. Now all of a sudden I am writing. And so I'm doing all kinds of different things, things that I just really couldn't have done before. Um, I rather like it because it's, at heart, a really strange film. There really isn't anything quite like it. Um, the idea of how to interview someone or what an interview should be about, I think is heretical. I don't think there was any, any model for that kind of thing. I could be wrong, uh, pre-Gates of Heaven. Also, because I'm a kind of contrarian at heart, when I was making the movie, I said, let's take all of the basic tenets of cinema verite and turn them on their head or ignore them completely. So instead of having a handheld camera, let's put the camera always on a tripod. Instead of available light, let's light everything. Um, instead of observing people but not being observed in turn, let's have everybody look directly into the lens of the camera. I was n noticing, uh, just watching this screening tonight, if you know where to look, you can see the edge of my head, a number of these frames, uh, to create this feeling that the people speaking are looking directly into the lens, I would put my head right against the lens of the camera. And often the cameraman would grab the back of my head and pull me back pull me out of the frame. And years later, I invented this device, the Interatron, to deal with that kind of thing. But in those days, it was just simply by trying to physically uh, put myself as close to the lens as possible. Um, there really isn't anything quite like it. I don't know if that's a good thing or a bad thing. I'm kind of proud of it. We have time for just one more question, I'm afraid. Um, because there's another movie happening after this. Uh, what part of the room haven't I gotten a question from? All the way in the back. Make it good. Oh, please. That's not making it good. <laughs> <laughs> All right, uh, you. Oh, by the way, 
it was just a little bit in excess of a hundred million dollars. Are you happy? Go ahead with your question, sir. Yeah, uh, I can't really summarize that in completely, but um, basically what was uh, Errol Morris' development as a filmmaker from Gates of Heaven through Thin Blue Line to um, Fast, Cheap and Out of Control, which uh, seemed to be a film about um, dreamers and... Uh, and uh One of the good things about I mean, if there are any good things about documentary filmmaking. Um, one of the good things might be is the fact you can reinvent the nature of what you're doing each time you make a movie. Um, properly considered, there are no rules about how you have to make any kind of movie, but certainly um, how you have to make a documentary film. There's a quote that I very much like. Um, it actually appeared in a Paris Review interview with uh, Gabriel Maria Marquez. And he was reading Kafka's Metamorphosis. A very young man and said to himself, I didn't know you were allowed to do that. I think that intuition itself is a really interesting intuition. Um, you have the opportunity in making movies uh, to reinvent movies. And I've tried, I haven't always been successful, but I've tried to do something different each time I do make something. Um, fast, cheap, I had the good fortune to work with one of the best uh, cinematographers in the world, Robert Richardson. And it was made around the time that I lost both my parents, my stepfather and my mother. I always saw and still see, uh, uh, or I should say I saw then and still see the movie as an elegy um, about mortality. Uh, and uh, There are themes in all of these movies that get recycled and repeated and explored. But there is uh, a mystery about people that still captivates me. Um, I, I sometimes talk about the Thin Blue Line as involving two different kinds of mysteries. Um, there's the mystery of what really happened in the Thin Blue Line, it's the mystery of who shot the Dallas police officer. Was it Randall Adams, the guy who is sentenced to death for that murder? He was innocent. Uh, and David Harris, uh, the guy who really was responsible for the killing. There's that issue, the issue who did it, who pulled the trigger, uh, who killed the cop. But there's an even deeper mystery, which is part of every single film that I've made, at least I hope that it is, is the mystery of people. Um, the mystery of what's inside their heads, of the mystery of what they're thinking. Um, trying to capture that dreamscape that's inside of every one of us. Um, 
and that's true of every single movie that I've made from uh, Gates of Heaven through to uh, my most recent effort, Tabloid, with Joyce McKinney. Um, if anybody thinks I know exactly who Joyce McKinney is, uh, they would be wrong. Uh, and I would say that's also true of many of my other protagonists, from Robert S. McNamara to Fred Lucher, um, and, and so on, through every single film that I've made. Sorry, we don't have time for more, because clearly there could be a lot more. But um, thanks for coming. Thank you, Errol. Well, thank you for having me.